world a more environmentally safe using renewable energy. Uh, and I'm sure that most people sitting in this circle, in this room tonight, in these chairs, and around this room, all would agree with that. Uh, that we need to give, be more conscious about giving attention to making our world uh, safe in terms of all things renewable and, uh, and when it comes to energy and using solar power. So our panelists here tonight uh, come with uh, degrees of expertise on this issue and passions about it, and so we want to hear from them. So if you all would just introduce yourself, take about uh, two minutes to just give an opening statement and introduce yourself and go down the line and do that. Um, I'm, again, I'm Logan atkinson Burke. I'm the Executive Director for the Alliance for Affordable Energy. The Alliance it is a consumer and environmental advocate uh, in the state of Louisiana for anybody who pays an electricity bill um, or anybody who reads the air. Uh, we think of consumers as more than just the bill they pay, um, but also the external costs, the health costs of living next to a gas plant or a coal plant or a pet coat plant, for example. Um, the, the costs of climate change, which as we all know are very, very real. And so when we talk about affordability, we really look at the much broader scope than just um, what your dollars and cents of, of your kilowatt hours are, although we certainly get involved in that as well. Um, we've been around for about 33 years, and um, our work is both here in New Orleans, we'll be mostly talking about New Orleans today, or at least I will, um, but we also work at the state level. Louisiana is, is one of only four states that does not have a consumer advocate that's either state funded or through the Attorney General's office. Uh, and so the Alliance fills that position. Uh, we do so at the Louisiana Public Service Commission, um, which is the regulator for electric utilities outside of Orleans Parish. Um, as we'll get into a little bit more later, we're in a very unusual situation. Many of you know this. Uh, that the New Orleans City Council is the regulator of our local investor-owned utility, that's Entergy New Orleans. This represents a tremendous responsibility, both as voters of, um, here in New Orleans, uh, but also uh, for the City Council as the regulator to make the kinds of decisions about the costs, um, the effects, um, and the benefits of different kinds of energy systems um, on everyone who lives here and works here. Um, that's all I'm going to say for now because I don't want to, you know, ruin the surprise. I'm, I'm going to pass it. Thanks, Logan. Yeah, I'm uh, Jay Hanks, and uh, a few of you in the audience may remember me when I was a professor at UNO here in the 1970s. Uh, but I left uh, in 1977 to work in the Carter administration, and uh, since that time I've worked for three different American presidents on energy issues. Uh, during the Clinton administration, I was the head of the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which is the lead uh, data and analytic arm of the Department of Government, uh, of, the, of the federal government. And, and um, at that time, I think I testified 25 times before Congress. Uh, and then in the Obama administration, I, at that time, I was actually director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. But when the BP oil spill hit, uh, I was, uh, and President Obama appointed a presidential commission to study it. I came back as the uh, director for research and policy for that study and helped <coughs> write, write it. Um, in 2008, I wrote a book called The Declaration of Energy Independence. Uh, I'm still quite active uh, in energy issues. I testified two weeks ago before the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, I write for the website Real Clear Energy. It should have an article coming out later this week. Uh, and, um, and I'm speaking at Carnegie Mellon University in a couple weeks. So uh, I've sort of covered the uh, energy gambit, and it's uh, fun to be back in uh, New Orleans. Uh, I like to eat. I like to be close to my grandchildren. Hi, I'm Pat Bryan. And I'm Pat Bryan. Ten or twelve years old, and uh, was involved in the freedom movement, which some people now call the civil rights movement. We called it the freedom movement, and uh, was a campus organizer, 
We've met with a number of campuses uh, across the Deep South. Uh, was a college professor, taught urban planning and housing, and uh, later became uh, organizer for the National Tenants Organization. And in that regard, uh, got my first foray with uh, Richard Nixon, and uh, was a co-appointee to the Price Commission. Uh, and with Jimmy Carter, uh, we were able to make some, some major challenges, uh, changes in his housing program. And uh, with the Bush administration, we got him to recognize environmental injustice. And with the Clinton administration, we were able to, uh, to get uh, him to sign an environmental justice executive order. So, I've kind of been around a few days. Uh, we organized uh, the largest environmental gathering ever right here in New Orleans and a People of Color Summit, Environmental Summit, and now we'll also uh, set out the principles of environmental justice. Thank you uh, to each of you for being on this panel tonight. Just before we, we get to the... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I'm late. I was coming from work. Um, my name is Eleanor Watchman. I'm helping start the Sunrise New Orleans chapter. Sunrise, for those that might not know, is a national grassroots movement that's working to mobilize uh, congressional members to sign on to a set of policies called the Green New Deal, which I'll probably talk about later. Um, and the goal that the local Sunrise chapter is trying to do is very much working with other environmental justice organizations and following suit of what's already been done in the city, but trying to build the, the coalitions and the power to um, push the Congress members to sign on to the Green New Deal. So that's the end. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you to each of you. Um, I, I want to real quickly just make everyone aware, uh, and this probably goes without saying, but do we need to talk just a little bit about those who are opponents to getting off the uh, off the grid and saying that that, that many people may be uh, fear mongers and, and expressing to people that this crisis is is much more um, at hand than what um, it really is and we're really not it's really not as serious as people are saying. Can we just talk a little bit about the crisis that we're going through right now and why it is an absolute necessity? and uh, emergency that we do talk about getting off the grid. Does anybody want to deal with that question? Why we're in crisis? Does anybody want to Okay, um, so th the first thing that I want to address is the phrase getting off the grid. Um, there is uh, an association of this big energy system that we've had uh, being all bad. Um, the energy grid is a nationwide interconnected uh, grid of transmission, distribution, and generation. Those are the three things that go into um, our energy system. Um, and the way that has been set up in the last hundred and change years is that we all share this grid, right? We all pay into it as ratepayers in one way or another. Um, what, whether we pay for it uh, through a, an investor owned utility, or through a cooperative utility or a municipal utility, um, we all pay our share for this larger grid. It's, a, it's quite frankly, a socialized <laughs> system. Um, it's one that we each pay some portion of that is associated with our <coughs> usage of it. Um, there is an interest in, um, in a lot of ways of, quote, getting off that grid entirely. Um, but as, an, as a consumer advocate perspective, um, our concern is that if we truly, quote, get off the grid or allow large customers, for example, to do so, that there are some pretty large costs that historically have been shared among all of us um, that would then be borne by those who cannot afford to, quote, leave the grid. Um, I 100% believe that we need to get off fossil fuels. We need to get off the, the, the way we've been um, generating electricity for the last hundred and some years, we need to get off that. 
in order to protect our climate and protect our planet and protect our way, way of life, certainly in South Louisiana. And, and that crisis is very largely associated with the kind of grid that we've been living on um, for all this time. Um, that climate crisis is a result, uh, very clearly, of greenhouse gases. Um, and largely those greenhouse gases have been coming from our power and energy sectors um, as a result of burning various kinds of fossil fuels. Um, this is an existential crisis in South Louisiana, as we know, as the seas are rising. Um, and we need to, it's been very clear more and more and I'm sure others will, will be able to speak even more eloquent, uh, far more eloquently than I can. Um, in the last two or three years, the data coming out of the international climate um, research community is telling us that this is happening faster than we thought. And so the, the need to move faster, to, to change our grid um, at a very fundamental basic level is necessary and is critical, and it, the time is now. Um, would you like to speak, Jay? Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with that. Uh, first, let's. There's a lot of crises out there, but one crisis crisis is climate change. Uh, since the industrial revolution, the temperature of the world has risen about one degree Celsius. Uh, uh, for those of you who think in Fahrenheit, which I think is probably almost everybody in the room, that's 1.8 degrees. And we've seen the effects of that. The sea levels are rising, the storms are more severe, uh, soils get dehydrated, and each degree that it goes up will be worse than the previous degree that went up for a whole host of scientific reasons. It is almost inevitable, even if we started doing everything right, that it's going up to about 2 degrees centigrade, uh, it could then easily get up to three or four degrees if we don't do anything. And it's something we will not be proud of with our grandchildren. I think we already have a lot to apologize for. Now, how to deal with it, to me, getting off the grid is not necessarily the strategy that produces uh, the reduction in carbon. Uh, it depends. If the grid is giving us dirty power, then we want to get off the grid. Uh, but in fact, coal is starting to just uh, has dropped sharply on the grid, and having a strong grid is actually uh, very helpful in getting wind power from the Midwest where there's a lot of excess wind power. So uh, they're producing uh, no carbon energy in the Midwest that needs a way to get to Louisiana and other places uh, that want to uh, do more and getting uh, off of dirty fuel. So there's, in my, in my role, there's a place for decentralized power, having uh, solar on your roof, having microgrids and all of that. But I can't conceive of a, of a position where you can do it without the grid. And in fact, the grid is on the road to maybe being cleaner than, than anything else. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see uh, about that. So uh, there, there are many issues out there we're trying to solve, but Mother Nature uh, doesn't sort of care how that carbon got up there. It's, it's up there. And just to put one more nail on, on this point, carbon stays in the atmosphere for over 100 years. And you might say, well, scientists certainly will figure out a way to suck it out of the atmosphere. I don't think they will. And I wouldn't put my eggs in that basket. So when we're putting uh, 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 this carbon up in the air, not only are we damaging our local community, we're damaging the people of Bangladesh, and we're uh, poisoning the atmosphere for our grandchildren. Well, I think, oh, yeah. Mr. Hold up to your face, sir. I think we're preaching to the choir here. I think every, there's not a person in this room who is not convinced that uh, fossil fuels are bad, that fossil fuels are destroying the planet. The question before us is how do we do anything about it? That's the central question here. How do we take power? And if you want, I mean, I ask everywhere I go, what are you telling your children about their future 12 years from now? We have to have a dialogue. We have to begin dialogues in our churches, in our organization. We have to build power to take on the question. At this point, the question 
were confided just between us. We're preaching to the choir. If it were not so, there would be standing room only in this place tonight. Everyone would want to come and get a piece of it. So the question to us is how do we organize? And that is a question that's left for our youth. Our youth are going to be the ones. Our youth have to come up with a plan. Our youth have to put their bodies on the line. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I want to echo that. I think uh, this notion, right, speaking to the choir, I think we're all here for similar reasons and how much we care about this. And I think kind of something that Pat was saying I want to echo is that, in my mind, a big problem is the lack of political will of our leaders to be doing the change that we know Could needs to be happening. Slow down. Sure, sure. <laughs> so one of the biggest issues is a lack of political will of our leaders to really be enacting the changes that we know are necessary. And not only is political will a big part of the problem, but also the economic implications are where a lot of the questions come from. And one of the tenets of this Green New Deal that Sunrise is trying to put forward is making sure that millions of green jobs are part of this process, because it can't just be producing less fossil fuels, it has to be transforming the economy in a way that's going to be working for current and future generations. So just to, again, echo what's been said, I think it's an economic problem, it's a political problem, also a social problem in terms of, as Logan was saying, certain communities are disproportionately affected over others, and it's really important to be aware of that when we are addressing these issues moving forward. Very good. Thank you all for addressing that question. Logan, would you begin by telling us um, how we can be ready now uh, to move forward with some renewable energy? How we, how we can do that? You got some information to share with us? Um, I think. Is, is this, this is my opportunity for this slides and things? Yes. I would actually love to go after Jay if that's okay. possible. All right. Jay, yeah. Jay. yeah. Only because he's set up, he's ready to roll. Is that okay. Right, well, I, I had a little. Please, please, yeah. yeah, yeah please. Yeah, yeah. Start with the history before yes, we give us the history. Okay, okay. Thank you. if we can put up the first slide. Thank you. Well, I think it's helpful to go back to the 1970s, which is when modern energy policy started, uh, partly as a response to the Arab oil embargo, partly because we thought we were running out of fossil fuels at the time, which, which it turns out we were not. So. <laughs> So uh, I, I, there's a, a slide that's uh, supposed to be up there of Jimmy Carter de uh, uh, dedicating the solar panels on the White House Brook. This is in June of 1979. And those are the old solar uh, uh, collectors that uh, were thermal. It had chemicals running through pipes, and it would run down with a heat exchanger and heat the water. That's, that's all that it did. It was kind of inefficient but it was uh, what we had at the time. But in Carter's speech, he said as a national goal that we would get 20% of our energy from renewables by the year uh, uh, 2000. And he said either this will be a great national achievement or it will be a road not taken and these panels will end up in a museum someplace. But one of those panels is now at the Carter Presidential Library in Atlanta. Uh, so in the year 2000, nothing had really happened. And there were some Swiss film producers that produced a film called A Road Not Taken. And it was about how Carter had talked about solar energy uh, and nothing had happened. Uh, I actually, uh, one of my few uh, film credits is I'm in that film. But it came out just at the time that things started to change. And so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, after all these years, that basically nothing happened. In the last dozen years, there's been a revolution in both wind and solar power. Uh, this slide only shows the, the large installations, which is only part of the uh, solar picture. But you can see it's gone from virtually nothing to something that's now becoming a much larger part. And we can foresee, in the not too distant future, getting to 20% uh, percent renewable, which a few years ago we would have said, that's great. I think everyone would agree now that's far from sufficient that we're aiming to get to 100, but 
uh, at least we are not going backwards or, and we are making some progress. So if we could go to the next slide. Uh, uh, this was two years ago. I, I was asked by President Carter to come over and give a speech on his farm because uh, 10 acres of his uh, farm have been converted to solar energy. And these are the modern photovoltaics, which uh, turn the uh, sunlight into electricity much better than the old thermal panels. And uh, for Carter, I think this was kind of vindication. At that time, he was uh, only 92. Uh, you know, feeling that he had gotten this started in the 1970s, and now we were starting to see the results of it. And if you don't keep up with what's going on, coal has gone down dramatically from 50% of U.S. Uh, production of electricity now down probably around 30 or so and heading much, much lower. And uh, if, if we look at our neighboring state of Texas in the next slide, this is a recent announcement to bring one of the projects up there to one gigawatt. Now you, you own your house with, uh, with uh, kilowatts and then the po power plants around here are megawatts and if you get enough megawatts you get up to gigawatts. It, this is a very large project. It's generating much more power than energy in New Orleans uses total. So we're, we're plowing ahead. And there are reasons why this has happened, if we go to the next slide, that many states have renewable portfolio standards. And uh, you can see politically they're in blue states, they're in red states. The red states are actually doing some of the best work. Uh, only one that has a 100% renewable uh, goal is Hawaii. And, and why they have very expensive uh, electricity, because they, they, in the past, have had to tank the oil there and then produce electricity with oil. Coal doesn't make any sense there, gas doesn't make any sense. But these states are doing it, and they've actually done us a favor. You can see in the southeast United States, we have not been participants in this. But the other states have driven down the cost of solar because uh, there's in the energy what's called the learning curve, and whenever you do something over and over again, you learn how to do it cheaper and better. Uh, Sun Power just announced in the last week or two they're going up to 22% efficiency on solar panels, and that doesn't sound that great, but it's actually pretty good. So, uh, uh, research and technology, the federal government has put a lot of money into that. Uh, Europe, and particularly Germany, has, has subsidized solar, so that's been very helpful in driving down costs. Uh, now, the advantage of the solar power uh, would be that it has low environmental impacts. And uh, we probably don't have time to go into all of this, but I would divide between what are the local impacts, which are the things that affect the, the area, it might be sulfur, it might be particulates, and then there's carbon, which, and methane, and other things that are really global pollutants. And we, as a very wealthy nation, are doing huge damage to low-lying areas off of Asia. Uh, it's, it's our pollution that's doing it. I think that's a moral problem, although I think most Americans don't want to uh, discuss that. But solar is great on both of those. It also has very rapidly co uh, dropping costs. So like just a couple of weeks ago, the utility in Indiana said, we've decided we're taking solar over everything else, basically uh, just because of price. Uh, and that's a state that doesn't have as much sunlight as we have. So, uh, and it also uh, can be used rooftop, it can be used for microgrid, it can be used by the utility itself. So uh, there's a lot of momentum, uh, but it's not happening fast enough. And then uh, the challenges of solar power, and, well, we, we miss the advantages. Well, I'm sorry, that's my fault. Those are the advantages of solar, uh, and again, I could list 10 more. But, uh, and then the challenges of some, some uh, solar power is that the sun doesn't shine all the time, wind doesn't blow all the time, so you have to store the power. There are many ways to store it, and anyone that's talked about is batteries. And also you need space for uh, solar. The so Carter's farm that produced one megawatt, that's 10 acres. So you have to sort of take into account where you put these things, and that's why roof rooftops can often be a valuable thing. Now, one final point, and, and I, uh, there is no silver bullet to this climate problem. There's a lot of silver buckshots. There's a hundred different things that we have to be doing. And just to kind of scare you a little bit, is that we thought we were making progress on vehicles because the cars, particularly after the actions of the Obama administration, are forcing the cars to be more uh, fuel efficient. 
So that's being undermined by many, uh, from many directions. Now in Washington, they're trying to undercut and stop the increased efficiency of automobiles. And people have suddenly decided that they're going to drive more. They're buying bigger vehicles. They insist that those vehicles have to accelerate fast, which means it's harder to meet the efficiency goals uh, that were set up by uh, President Obama. So there is a lot of silver buckshot. This thing has to be approached on many, many different issues. If you can win on one issue, take that issue and move to the next issue. I don't think you, we can solve all 500 of them at the same time. Any response by any of our panelists before we move on? Uh, I think it's not just when we're dealing with the question of, of power, it's not just power for electricity, power for everything. And we have got to change our appetites. Now, we want to move into this next period with all of our cars, dishwashers, you name it. All of the things that we have told ourselves over the years we must have. I'm afraid to tell you that we can't afford those, all of these things anymore. We're going to have to curb our lifestyles. We're going to have to live more like people live in some of these places that we call undeveloped. And there's one kernel here that we have to take on. You cannot ignore what the young lady said about the political will. We have to take our political leaders to task. We're giving them a pass in Louisiana. We got the best politicians money can buy. I did a study in, of the legislature in, 90, I think it was 95. And the study basically said, that corporations give money to people who are in leadership of certain committees that can control outcomes. And that's, that's, that's our system. We've got to change it. All right. All right. Uh, before we move on to long I mean, start my thing. Yeah. Before we move on to that, just a word. Uh, normally, it is uh, our process that if you have a question, that you would write it down on an index card and drop it in one of the buckets that are on either side of the stage. We're going to do it a little bit differently tonight. Um, we're going to uh, have you ask your question from this mic. So at the question and answer time, which will come uh, after our panelists are done presenting, you'll get an opportunity to ask some questions. You will have the, the opportunity to take the mic yourself. That is with one caveat. Um, sometimes when people get a hold of the mic, they have the tendency to just flow with it forever in the day, and we don't need for that to happen. So formulate your question first uh, on, on this index card, as Reverend Barnwell has done, and then uh, kind of get in your mind what you want to ask, and then I'll give you the mic. But if you go too long, i got a long tether, you ain't get back out of your hand, all right? So Logan, if you please uh, give us what you got. That. So I wanted to start with a visual because it just helps, I think. Uh, we in New Orleans are very fortunate to be at this end of the what's called solar penetration per capita. That means what we have here is a list of states. These are states, and the only city here is represented as New Orleans. And it shows how much solar we have per capita as compared to all of these states. Now, this was actually a, uh, included as a page in Entergy New Orleans' 90 megawatt application for it's a three-project portfolio from just last year. And the reason they included it was to say, look how great we're doing, right? Look at how much solar we have in New Orleans. 
But I will remind you that all but one of 41 megawatts that is currently installed in the city of New Orleans is installed using your money, meaning public or rather private dollars, that is not energy dollars. Residents in New Orleans have installed 40, residents and businesses have installed 40 megawatts of solar just in Orleans Parish. Back in 2007, we started out in at the beginning of a, what became a solar boom here in the city and then of course in the rest of the state. Uh, we were called a solar city back in 2007 and until just a couple of years ago, we were in the top 10. We've recently fallen to, um, in terms of major cities in the country, to number 16 in terms of penetration of solar. That's largely because uh, so many of these other states that, um, that Jay was talking about that have renewable portfolio standards have sped up their installation of solar on the utility side. Uh, but we have slowed down right now our installation of residential and commercial rooftop and instead the utility is starting to pick up the, the, um, the building of our solar um, resources. So, as I say, uh, residents and, and commercial customers have installed 40 megawatts. So far, Entergy has installed one megawatt uh, that is on a sort of a farm, a very small farm. Uh, I say solar farm, I just mean that they're harvesting energy. I don't mean that there are cows. It's just over the industrial canal in New Orleans East. They have also just very recently completed an in installation of 2.5 megawatts on a commercial rooftop uh, that is part of a five megawatt um, pilot project that they're doing on large commercial um, and industrial rooftops in the city. Uh, this is the beginning of the utility starting to take ownership of renewables, largely from pressure from the city council as their regulator, largely from public pressure. Uh, but also they're starting to see the costs come down, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute as well. Um, the, a couple of years ago, Entergy New Orleans um, made a commitment uh, to install 100 megawatts of renewables. Very recently, uh, the city council insisted that they go ahead and move forward with this. And 90 megawatts of that first 100 um, were applied for in a single application with three projects. One is a 20 megawatt project, and none of these have been approved or built yet. I'm just describing sort of what has been applied for. One is a 20 megawatt project in New Orleans East on NASA land. Um, one is a uh, 20 megawatt project in St. James Parish, and another is a 50 megawatt project in, um, in Washington Parish. And these three projects represent um, a really lots of different ways of, um, of acquiring renewables, some of which are very cost effective and some of which aren't terribly cost effective. Um, but part of what is what moving forward with that silver buckshot is, let's figure out the ways that work the best and, and think about all of the additional benefits that come with um, installed solar. For example, jobs. Um, I think we're going to hear more from, um, from our Sunrise Movement in a minute about jobs. But something that's important to know is that, that the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics says that solar installer is the number one job for growth in the U.S. in the next decade. That means if you are looking to be in a growing field, solar installation is the number one thing to go after. That's a great opportunity. And it means more than just being on rooftops. It means designing these systems. It means being part of the, um, the whole distribution chain of getting those solar, that solar out into fields and onto rooftops around the country. Um, but there are other ways that we can do it. So we've got, um, through this 90 megawatt process that's been put forward to the council, or 90 megawatt portfolio, we've got these three, and some of them are going to be built by third parties. Some of them will be built by Entergy themselves. And then Entergy will, as they do with all resources that they build and own, um, Entergy will pass all of those costs on to us, um, which is the way this will all work. 
So the thing that we try to make sure is that when those things are deployed, that they're done in a way that is cost effective so that we're not paying more than we need to. Um, as Jay mentioned, the cost of solar have plummeted in the last seven years. Um, and in fact, I've been involved in integrated resource planning all over the state this year. Uh, there are four major utilities that are conducting these 20 year long, stand, long looking plans at how we're going to meet our energy needs. And I'll tell you, the two of the, the three that I've seen drafts for have to acknowledge that the only way they can get their computer models to pick anything but renewables <laughs> is to force the model to do so, to limit it, because wind and solar are so cheap and are getting cheaper. That is the story right there. That this isn't just we need to do it from a climate perspective, but we also need to do it from a pocketbook perspective. We know that um, fossil fuels are more expensive now, and as if our state continues to export things like natural gas, that will only push the, the costs up for that. Um, but it's also, again, there's the job benefits as we start to deploy this completely different kind of energy system. One other thing that I think is important about solar, and especially for a city like New Orleans, is the opportunity for resilience. Resilience from a distributed system. Uh, we talk about an energy system right now, historically one, where you've got distribution poles, which are the ones that run down your, you know, through your street, down your neighborhood, right to your house. Uh, you've got transmission lines, those ones that will bring uh, wind energy from the interior into places like southern Louisiana. Um, and then you've got, historically, those big, giant, many megawatt power plants. Well, what's happening now is an acknowledgement that if we can distribute those resources, that when a major disaster happens, as happened more recently in Florida, in these, um, the hurricanes of the last couple of years, the, the locations that had distributed resources, that is solar on rooftops with paired batteries, those places were able to come back faster and were able to serve not only um, rate payers, but also serve you know, important um, critical infrastructure. So hospitals, nursing homes, um, city halls, those places that needed to get up and running. And so, we're seeing more of that distributed type resource on things like microgrids and closer to home. Um, let's see. The, the last thing that, uh, that I'm going to mention is that so far, uh, the, the reason Louisiana isn't really doing so hot is that at the state level, remember I mentioned that uh, City of New Orleans has that regulatory authority. Again, that's a tremendous opportunity for us to move forward, as it has been in, in the last number of years, which is why we're you know, at this end of this line. Um, but the Public Service Commission thus far has been far more um, conservative as it relates to moving us forward on renewables and energy efficiency. And so um, I have to say I was very pleased to see that on the very same day that the New Orleans City Council uh, just a couple of weeks ago fully approved um, the, the moving forward of, of the new gas plant along with a $5 million fine, the very same day the Louisiana Public Service Commission approved a 50 megawatt solar farm for Entergy Louisiana, um, which will be just outside of Baton Rouge. And so it was a really interesting um, sort of flip it upside down, right, where the city council was, um, was holding us back a little bit from my perspective, um, and the Louisiana Public Service Commission was acknowledging the cost effectiveness of you know, a large solar installation in Baton Rouge. Um, one more thing that I will say uh, about something that I've heard in the news recently from Entergy New Orleans is a pilot program that they're doing, and some of you who are uh, uh, installers here in, in the room might know about it or might be involved, I don't know, is a 100 home um, installation project where low-income residents will have access to what is being called free uh, solar on their rooftop for a, a bill credit at the end of each month of $30. Um, this very well may be a wonderful project. It's certainly wonderful for the folks who, uh, who receive the solar panels on the rooftop. However, um, this is a different sort of system than would be if you went out and either bought or leased a system. 
largely because um, the, it's tied directly to the grid. And so rather than those kilowatt hours going to credit the, the homeowner, uh, those kilowatt hours go straight to the grid and do not benefit the homeowner. Um, the thing that, that I will certainly be watching out for is cost effectiveness. We don't yet know how much um, ratepayers will be charged for this 100 uh, home pilot, uh, but I certainly hope that they have worked with, um, with local solar installers who have, uh, are at that good end of the learning curve and can do this cost effectively, because that's what's really important um, as well. Um, that is all I have to say for now. I will assume there will be questions later, but for now I'm going to pass it off. All right. Bellis, anything you want to uh, add or uh, to, to what Logan just presented? Can we talk about, uh, uh, Mr. Wells, did you? Uh, can we talk about legislation for a moment and uh, what you're doing, Mr. Pat, uh, on? In, in terms of approaching, getting some legislation change, uh, change, change in, to this effect, uh, as we talk about getting some more renewables, and also, Eliana, if you'll talk about um, what the Sunrise Movement is doing after Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Reverend. Um, cost, cost is the connection that we have to make to our people, the ratepayers. For example. We just lost a battle to stop the gas plant in the east. And people were thinking, well, it's out in, some people were thinking, it's out in the east, it's not going to affect me. But every ratepayer is going to have to pay. And I don't think we drilled down well enough on what the cost when I look at it, they say $210 million to construct a plan. Okay, who's going to finance it? Entity, of course. Who's going to operate it? Entity, of course. Uh, what's, when you add all of that up, we're talking about not $12 or $15 a month. We're talking about something between $30 and $50 a month depending on the financing, which they have never told us. We've got Sewage and Water Board playing the same kind of games with us. We have Cox Cable playing the same kind of games with us. These are all utilities. These are people who have uh, uh, the franchise to, to sell it only to us. So I, I believe that we need to, uh, as aware citizens, build a campaign to keep these entities from running our people out of the city. It's too expensive for me to stay here. I'm retired. My, my income is fixed. So I need some protection. I need the protection of a group that makes the city council accountable, that goes to the city council and says, look, set up a commission to study. Set up a commission to study the best ways for us to have cost-effective electricity, water, and sewer, and cable. Now, they're not going to be jumping up and down to do that. But it's going to take a petition drive. It's going to take people going down to the city and demanding it. And demanding that they set up a commission that's not a good old boy commission. You know, they play a lot of good old boy games. For example, just today, I got a call before coming here telling me that the Sewage and Water Board has gotten a new employee, a chief of staff, to the 
Mr. Corbin, who is an executive director, a position not in the budget, but paid for by two powerful entities in the city. Now, the executive, executive director now has someone in between him and the rest of the staff that he has to report to and that the staff has to report to. An example of, you know, that we don't have the political power to, we, we haven't built it. We can build it. We can build it. But we've got to get to work. And I suggest a simple campaign of putting before the city council how to study to keep our bills in order or to lower our bills. There are some people in the city that don't pay their fair share. You have a lot of universities, businesses, who should be paying more than a senior citizen. So I submit to you that the tail is now wagging the dog. And the dog needs to get control of the tail. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. Um, Ms. Eliana, would you tell us uh, what the Sunrise Movement is doing? Sure. So right now, there's several stages of Sunrise's strategy. Um, Currently, they're trying to pass a set of policies or a resolution in Congress to then get the next stage moving, again, as I was speaking to before, trying to create this political will. So the Green New Deal is a set of policies that, again, if this resolution is passed, none of it's going into law yet, but just passing the resolution creates the you know, political will in Congress to really talk about concrete legislation. So the legislation is coming. Um, and again, it will be addressing jobs where communities are going to be um, uh, moved in terms of you know, the effects of climate change in certain communities might need to be relocated. Um, also talking about um, again, as I was saying, like the other jobs and infrastructure that will be needed. So the policies are going to be addressing the political, social, and economic aspects of climate change. And again, it's doing it at a national level. But as a local chapter, we are interested very much so in also supporting the local efforts that are happening around policy and advocacy. Again, because we're a national organization and there are so many amazing partners on the ground, like Alliance for Affordable Energy and so many others that we're working with, we are very much looking to those experts to lead the way, and we will you know, mobilize people to come to city council hearings and work on the policies already being suggested. But um, as a national chapter, our goal is to support the national efforts uh, at the congressional level. All right. Uh, thank you for that. that was, uh, what I thought was very interesting about what, what you just said is that there's communities that are going to have to be relocated. Um, are there any besides our, I mean, I would think New Orleans would be on that list, am I correct? That, are there, what are there some other communities that may have to be relocated? So the specifics of that is not something that I'm Super knowledgeable, the national team is more aware, but the the point, I'll, I'll get my list of sunrise principles in my bag over there, but um, the frontline communities and those most affected are going to be the ones leading the charge about how that relocation happens. And making sure that the communities, again, most affected are being able to advocate most for what they need in terms of, of the future changes. Thank you very much. Oh, you know, go ahead, Mr. Hayes. There's a federal program that already uh, relocated communities. And some of the uh, Louisiana communities have already been relocated under that program. It doesn't get a lot of publicity because they're very small communities and they're very poor, and so they tend to be neglected. Uh, Richard communities, and, and in you know, some respect, some other places, uh, we have a home. So we're, we're going to hold out a lot longer than other places around the world and other places uh, along the coast of Louisiana. But we're, we're already seeing that happen here, uh, just as we're seeing uh, around the world places that used to be farmland can no longer be farmed because of the dehydration of soil. So we're starting to see the early effects. I, mean, I don't think, if you did a poll, I don't think most people in Louisiana realize that we're there, there's a fund. You, you are paid for leaving the community and do something like that. I don't think most people realize that. 
what's going on. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to move to some questions now. As we move into our question time, I've got um, um, one audience member who's just got a quick announcement because there's a big uh, panel discussion going on tonight at the Carver Theater. I know some of them got to get to that, um, but if you have a quick announcement. Uh, I believe the discussion at the Harvard, and somebody may know more about it. Are you going to that? No. No. Uh, I was talking about the discussion around uh, Zulu and uh, blackface and all that, but you have another guy. Hi, good evening. I apologize for my lateness. I went to the wrong place. Um, thank you, Pat. Um, my name is Belinda Parker Brown, and I'm with Louisiana United International. And wow, it's a very interesting audience here. I'm here to plead with you on tonight to let you know that we have something that we all can unite on here in the state of Louisiana. And this is serious. Um, most of you probably know about the Amendment 2 that was passed last November 2018. Um, the citizens of Louisiana, we were very successful in getting that unconstitutional, racist Jim Crow law off the books. But they did not grandfather that law in. And I'm not happy about that. Because we have over 2,000 people that that law should have been retroactive for. Those people are sitting in prison right now. And they deserve the opportunity to have a fair trial or be let go free. Thank you for that call. Sound like I'm in the right place. Well, I'm going to make this real quick because I said I'm on my way to Dr. Preshawn. She wrote the book, um, Dead Man Walking, and Preshawn, I'm sorry, Preshawn, and she, um, a very good friend of mine, actually she, she, she gave me my name, Belinda Parker Brown, A Force for Justice, because I'm serious about the work that we're doing here in the state of Louisiana when it comes to the criminal justice system is a disgrace. Louisiana should be shamed of itself for the way we treat people and railroad people through these godforsaken hell home prisons and jails across this state. And it's not going to happen on our watch. We have to let our voices be heard that we don't want to live in a country where you're treating people like animals or worse than animals because I love animals and I don't have a problem with animals. But people are being treated worse than animals in these godforsaken hell holes. And a lot of people don't deserve to be there. But because of that unconstitutional racist Jim Crow law that was enough that you can put people in prison with just the decision of 10 people. So that you can snatch especially black Americans off the street and put them in jail and make slaves out of them. So my announcement is tonight, and I hope everybody got a leaflet, that we are going to, we have kicked off a campaign. And I like the fact that campaigns is something that we all need to come together and support one another. There's so many things, but this is one that I know for sure that we can win. We can get the victory on this one. But it's going to take all of us united together. So please support us and come out on March the 16th. That's this Saturday at the Beth. Um, I'm going to make sure I get it right because we didn't change locations. There's opposition. I think all the devils came out on, and they. Um, but they can't stop us. It's at Bethany United Methodist Church, and I have Pastor Reed. Right here with me, Pastor Reed, why don't you stand up so everybody can see you. Thanks to this gentleman here, this pastor, this man of God that um, allowed us to have um, the venue to host our community forum so that we can come out and hear from everybody that wants to support and unite and join with us in this effort. 
okay? So please come. I have my cell phone number on there. Is there anything that you would like to say? Well, I, I just want everybody to come out. This is very important. Um, we work with it. It's also the one that's most compatible with solar. If you, in three or four years, I don't think we're going to build that plant. Uh, and so we were right at the cusp. And my, my feeling was that I opposed the council approving the plant because they did not consider the facts in an accurate manner. They were fed misinformation by the utility and they were fed misinformation by the uh, consultant that the city council uses. And I, I'm not sure how I would have come down if I had all the information because as a non-intervener, uh, there's much information that's hidden from the public. Uh, I, because of my background, have done the national uh, projections of energy growth in the United States. I'm not allowed to see that information as a citizen of New Orleans uh, from my own utility. So for that reason, I oppose it. My feeling is that it was approved in the legal process. I think the council vote was a wrong vote. Uh, but it carries legal consequences. So in, in my view, probably the best thing is to insist that the next 200 megawatts be sold. Uh, I think that the actors was an outrage, but I can name 10 other things that I thought were worse than the paid actors, which was misinformation, the hiding of information, uh, the use of charitable contributions to force groups around town to support the energy position, which I think is a violation of the federal tax code. Uh, so the, the, the process just stopped at high heaven. I think the, the way to fix it is, I think the, the council, I think in many ways, I might disagree with others. I think many of them are very well intended. Uh, I think they do not have adequate technical staff. So I would, as a citizen, I would say I want the next 200 megawatts to be solar. I want you to listen more to interveners like Logan, who knows what she's talking about, and don't kind of dismiss those arguments. And get yourself some technical staff and engineers and people who actually can evaluate what energy tells you rather than just accept it at face value. Very good. And thank you, Mr. Hayes. And, and, and credit, yeah, credit to, to Logan Berg and, and the, and the uh, whole Cayenne Coalition, including Pat Bryant and uh, uh, Monique Harden, who's on that uh, Cayenne Coalition, Sylvia McKenzie and Happy Johnson, uh, Sophie Zakin, I can't list all the names and I don't want to miss anybody, but that kind of coalition that came together as a sub-coalition of Justin Beyond, who did incredible work making some great strides uh, during that whole three-year uh, fight against the energy plant. So, so fantastic to all those involved in that. Um, yes? Just one word. We have the Use your microphone, please, sir. We have the best city council money can buy. All of them are accustomed to taking money from entity. All right. So, next question um, is, um, who is doing microgrids right, in quotations, and why is it important? Okay, I'm not going to be able to say who's doing microgrids the best. Uh, but I can point to uh, what happened during Hurricane Sandy which was in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, there, there was a devastation of the power grid then. Uh, but there were certain parts of, of New York City that, were, that remained um, on, on, uh, up and running, let's say. Um, this is largely because there are small microgrids. Microgrids, by the way, uh, you kind of envision a neighborhood maybe but it can actually be just one building that has many, many um, uh, energy users within that large building. And so there were some apartment complexes on, on the island of Manhattan that were able to stay up and running as a result of their own microgrids. Following Hurricane Sandy, as a result of, um, of those microgrids doing so well, the city and actually the state of New York said, we are going to incentivize this. We're going to do everything we can to support these kinds of microgrids. And so what you're seeing now is in places that have, have effectively had their slate wiped clean, for example, Puerto Rico, they're building not only microgrids, 
um, but mini grids, and they're building um, a very different kind of energy system than, than we are used to. And they're doing this um, in order to basically deal with both the adaptation, so as we're dealing with more and more storms, knowing that we're going to have to rebuild after devastating storms, um, but also the mitigation of climate change, uh, which is that reduction of greenhouse gases. And so to me, that's what a microgrid doing done right does. Um, you could also do a microgrid that includes fossil fuel generation. Uh, but my perspective is done right includes things like solar and various kinds of energy storage that range from thermal storage to battery storage and those sorts of things. Thank you. Um, we're going to take questions from the audience now. If you can, uh, probably be best if you can come up to the microphone so everybody can hear you. So many of us think we have loud voices, but we do not. Come on up to the microphone. Thank you. Um, since this panel is sponsored by Justice and Beyond, I want to ask us to dig a little bit more into the justice questions around solar. Um, obviously, climate change itself is a justice issue, which is very clear in New Orleans. Uh, affordability is a justice issue, but there are also justice issues embedded in who gets the job and who owns the panels, and who will profit from this new technology. So in addition to kind of having community involvement, which has been alluded to, I wonder if you can all, or at least some of you, address where is justice or injustice here in the details of how we make this transition. Well, I mean, I, I tend to look at this from a, kind of a global standpoint. Uh, when you take, you're going to see capital moving that would otherwise have been invested in coal and oil and being invested in solar and conservation and efficiency, and, and that's good. Uh, so there'll be losses of jobs in some areas, and there'll be gains of jobs in other areas. Uh, the coal industry, uh, blame, I've been down in the coal mine, and, and uh, the one I was in, I'm sure the one they showed me wasn't uh, at random. Uh, there were three people down there operating robots, and, and so there were very few workers in that coal mine. So uh, th there's not a huge amount there. And, and I'm sure as the renewable energies uh, become more widespread in a competitive market, they'll be finding ways to do things with fewer employees, because that's the society that we live in. So uh, I, I think the major role, to me, from a, a a justice standpoint is to have job training. I, I think our public education system has uh, gotten worse uh, in many respects. We don't support it. Uh, and uh, so the key is, uh, and this is in West Virginia where you know we also have to have sympathy with people there. They're going to lose their jobs in the coal mines because we can't continue to burn coal. They need job training. We need training here to allow people in the community benefit from the jobs that are, are created. And so the question is, and, and this is a balancing act. I mean, I, there's not all the answers. Pros are on one side. The, the current solar package, the probably the cheapest solar power is going to come from the solar farm. They have a uh, tracking system, so the, the panels actually track the sun during the day. But if you want the benefits to be in New Orleans and jobs, then you might have to have ones here. That might end up being a little bit more expensive. So it's going to be a balance. I think there's going to have to be where can we get the most environmental protection for the dollar, and in some cases, how can we help our local economy uh, in the process? I like that question uh, because justice would demand a change in who owns it. Justice would demand that. The oil companies and their subsidiaries, who for the last 150 years have ruined the planet and have staged wars on top of wars on top of wars, you know, like the war they're trying to kick off with Venezuela. That's a war for oil. And I think, it's, you know, I think that we're smarter than that. I think we have to take control of 
the ownership of this great resource, the sun, and the implement those things that, that will give us electricity. And we have to think out of the box on who gets the jobs. The people who've been left out need to get the jobs. At least they need to have a fair chance at the jobs. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. All right. Um, just to add briefly, if that's okay. I also really appreciate, appreciate the question and you grounding us here. And I think one of the tenets that Sunrise talks about is standing with other movements for change and really trying to create solidarity with other justice movements. But I will also say that as much as I you know, uphold Sunrise in many ways, I think it has a lot of room to grow as an organization and I think it hasn't done the best job of being inclusive and talking about race and class and a lot of these other difficult issues that need to be at the forefront of the conversation. And I think especially being in Louisiana, we have a really big opportunity to be shaping the conversation in a way that is really addressing those issues. And it's something that I've talked about with folks from um, 350 and both from Center for Law and Policy and a few other organizations thinking about having returning citizens be at the forefront of having these new green jobs as one of many ideas. But we're really encouraging any and all ideas to this conversation to help this implementation, hopefully, of the Green New Deal in Southeast Louisiana be as just and equitable as possible. So I'll say at the end, and I have a contact list sheet if you want to fill it out, we're definitely looking for more ideas and brainstorming, so we really welcome any and all ideas that you have. I have one thing to say about ownership. Uh, very recently, the city council took the first step in um, bringing community solar to New Orleans. Uh, this is a style of solar ownership where renters who don't have rooftops to put their solar on, uh, or folks who can't afford a, a large uh, rooftop array, can be part owner, sort of in the same method as a food co-op, for example, just outside these doors. Uh, you can have part ownership and, and ownership not only of those panels, but also of the benefits that come from them over time. Uh, what's really going to be important going forward is how those benefits are accrued and how the council allows those benefits to be, uh, to share, to be shared. Uh, this is what comes down to really minute policy decisions. Uh, but what's important is that the council continues to hear from us that these decisions must be made equitable, in, in the interest of equity. Um, that is to say, and, and I'll explain very specifically what I mean as it relates to community solar, I've been pushing um, because the council insists that, um, that the credit that should go to customers from a community solar array should not equal uh, what it would if it goes on your own rooftop for various reasons. Um, and I really insisted that at the very least, that low-income customers um, should have access in, in, to community solar in the same way that anybody who can put it on their own rooftop can, for all kinds of reasons, largely so that these customers have a way to get themselves out of regular arrears, out of that cycle of constantly having their power shut off and constantly having to go to their churches or their local community action associations for help on their bills. Um, for me, this is an equity issue that we have to look, you know, right down into the weeds on every single decision, whether it's a renewable portfolio standard, which I also believe we're going to get soon, uh, or a decision about um, any particular solar installation or policy. Thank you, Logan. I know that Renata has a question next, and then uh, Reverend Marwell will be after that, and then anyone else uh, will be after that. Uh, I have a question for Eliana. Uh, I want to know what kind of events uh, you are possibly uh, organizing here in New Orleans. Thanks, Renata. So uh, there's a couple events coming up that you all should look out for. Um, Sunrise and um, some other organizations we're working with will be a part of the Tulane Climate Action Week that's happening next week, um, March 18th through 22nd. Um, on Friday, March 15th, there's a National Youth Climate Strike. Um, and there's some students from Ben Franklin and a few other high schools in the city who are working to organize this climate strike. So if that's something interesting to you, um, I have some information that I could give you after, so come up to me for that. And um, 
There'll also be a national Sunrise Tour stop. So as you can tell, I'm very much not an expert. I'm learning a lot. But ideally, March, sorry, not March, May 7th is going to be the national tour stop date, where national Sunrise folks will be here as well as panelists from local organizations who will be talking about how Sunrise could look in Southeast, Southeast Louisiana. So um, again, more information will come, but if you want to give me your contact info at the end, I can share. So again, Tulane Climate Action Week, National Youth Climate Strike, uh, and then this tour, which will likely be on May 7th. Do you have a, a, a web address that we can yes. go to? So the email is sunriseneworleans at gmail.com. And we're also on Facebook. We are Sunrise Movement New Orleans. Sunrise Movement. Sunrise Movement New Orleans. That's right? Facebook and then right. Gmail is Sunrise New Orleans at Gmail. All right, very good. All right, Ramon. Uh, Logan, you say that change needs to come first from the city council. Can you talk about what strategy we could all be part of to get the city council on our side? You know, I think we need a careful, organized strategy to make this happen. It's not going to happen if we're all approaching the city council individually. Would you speak to that? Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Sure. Um, so, first I'm going to tell you about what I think is a win as a result of just exactly what you're talking about. Um, I, I mentioned and, and uh, has been mentioned up here tonight, a renewable portfolio standard. That is just very simply a uh, decision from a, a regulatory or um, lawmaking body that says that um, that utilities must provide energy, um, some portion of energy, by a time certain, or they get dimmed, let's say they get fined, right? Um, and, but that certain part of that energy needs to come from renewables. And, and renewable portfolio standards look different in every single state. Um, but just last season, uh, back, back in the fall, thanks to great work by um, Louisiana or New Orleans 350, um, and Andy this. Right <laughs> and Andy right there with your hand waving. It's all you <laughs> Um, and a lot of the, the other folks in this room uh, signing on to a letter to the city council to say, we need this renewable portfolio standard, and we need to make sure, but, but first, we're not asking you to just make one up. We want a fair process to get to a fair and equitable renewable portfolio standard. And uh, back a number of months ago, we got a commitment from the council saying, we're going to do that. And so it's my understanding that at the next utility committee meeting, they're going to be opening a rulemaking on a renewable and clean portfolio standard, which is a tremendous first step. It will be the first one in this Gulf South region, um, it, and the first one in a while that's been created. And so, um, and so what I would suggest is working together as a group on how to make sure that that portfolio standard meets the needs and ideals of justice, of equity, of affordability, and making sure that the that how we move forward as a city in terms of our energy needs and, and um, resources works for all of us. That it isn't just, oh, it's clean. It needs to be so much more than that, I believe. And I think that that happens if we work together. Does that answer your question? Right. Any other questions for now? Yeah, uh, let's go back down memory lane to the 70s. Uh, you know, Jimmy Carter put the solar panels on the roof. Mary Commoner railed against the industry, you know, the fossil fuels industry is not wanting that dispersed energy source of solar when he ran for president as a communist in, in 1980. Reagan got elected, took the solar panels down. In 1982, he loosened laws to allow more monopolies, corporations form more monopolies. Come 40 years later, here we are, having lived in this 40 years of the day of life, market gods, uh, and we've got an oligopoly of fossil fuel industries and a local monopoly, utility monopoly. If we do not go with dispersed solar, as Barry Commoner wanted back 
in, 19, in the 1970s. If we don't go with the first solar, solar panels, local, how are we going to break the yoke of these monopolies and these oligopolies? Uh, I'll be at risk here, I'm sure. Uh, it, it sometimes takes large organizations to do big projects. And uh, if you look at why Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana added the solar they have, it's, it's not because they're hearing that from the citizens of the state, it's because big businesses have moved into the state and would say, we insist on having solar. Yeah, and so the, the problem, you, you know, the problem with me, I, I've been very critical of oil companies. However, I'm more critical of the person that drives the two-ton vehicle with one person in the car, because they're the ones that are ordering the oil. The oil companies wouldn't exist if people weren't driving this car. So, you know, like Poco said, we've met the enemy, and the enemy is, is us. And right now, you can put in wind projects in the, in the Midwest that generate huge amounts of energy. They're very big projects. They need a way to move, and they have to move across the grid. So, some, you know, I have seven kilowatts of solar on my roof. Uh, I, I, after Carter was president, I had, uh, I don't know how many kilowatts, uh, well, it wasn't kilowatts at that time. I had the solar water heaters on, on my house. But we're talking about Big, the amount of energy that America consumes in a year is huge. And so there's going to have to be some big solutions to it. And, and I've always gone off the grid because the grid is giving me um, dirty power. But when the grid starts giving me clean power, um, I, I think that's a good thing because that you're really moving the needle. And, and, and Mother Nature knows how much carbon is going out there. And it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a scientific question at the end of the day. How, how do you get less greenhouse gases and therefore slow down the, the, the uh, change of the climate while at the same time uh, breathing less uh, dirty air so you can be clean and, and pay less money for it? The, the key is, can people get what they can afford? And, and I, I'll tell you, I have scars in my body because I've taken on utilities multiple jurisdictions. I've been an intervener against them. I've, I've undergone threats from them. Uh, and I've turned down huge amounts of money from them. I've never accepted a dime, and I've been offered hundreds of thousands of dollars to alter what I said. But that does not mean that at the end of the day, I'm looking for results. And I want the results. And if the result happens to come from a grid, uh, that's where it comes from. My friend here has just a quick addition to that, but then I want Mr. Pat to respond to taking on those big industries. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just said you don't like big SUVs, right? Because, I mean, they create more demand for the oil pump. Well, dispersed solar is the same thing. You, you, just, you just admitted you put solar on your house. That helps create less demand for the fossil fuels. It weakens that industry. I mean, even if you even if you lower the demand for natural gas by a couple of percent, the price drops. It doesn't take that big. I mean, you know, in order to take the power from the companies, you need to lower their their profits. And a change in energy, you know, demand of natural gas national, nationally by like even ten percent, if we all had solar panels, would weaken those industries that are now oligopolies and monopolies. And th we can, you know, at some point, you know, we can't, we're gonna be paying for the carbon. One way or another, we're gonna pay for it. We're living in La La Land right now, not paying for it. I mean, so. But I, I would just say, like for instance, on the, um, the auto efficiency standards, the automobile industry right now is much more reasonable on that than the, the, the party that is in charge of the U.S. Senate and the party that's in charge of the White House. So the, the problem that, you know, I don't agree with the auto companies because they, they, they don't come as far as I want to go, but they're not as big a problem as the White House and the U.S. Senate. And those were elected by the American people.
Mr. Pat, you're doing some work to take in on some big industries. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, within the family of petrochemicals, you have some buzzards. They make chemicals, and they make them in our backyards here in Louisiana. And they poison people in the process. And some of those people that have been here to justice and beyond, railing against the construction of a Formosa plastic company up in uh, St. James Parish. And then we've, uh, t uh, we've been working along with people in reserve who are being poisoned by uh, DuPont Denka. Denka is a Japanese firm, of course you know DuPont. They joined together to kind of uh, obscure the fact that DuPont was poisoning people. So the Japanese company takes on the <laughs> nasty part of the production. Uh, there's a chemical called chlorophyll that's been produced about 1,500 yards from a school. And the chemical causes many problems in your body. People have suffered from all kinds of cancers. And in tests in, the, in St. John the Baptist Parish, 100% of the people tested have chlorophyll in their bodies. A similar situation happened in Illinois. And that community, the governor and the legislature and the senators took action and shut the company down. We asked our governor to do the same thing. But our governor hasn't even responded to the letter. So in response to the governor's lack of response, the people were saying, we're going to walk to the governor. We're going to walk to the governor, and we want people to watch us walking all over the world. And that's going to be a small five-day march that will highlight what's happening here in Louisiana, but a larger march in October when the governor and the state representatives and the senators are running for office. We've got to dramatize what these companies are doing. And we've got to let the people know who our friends and our enemies are. Thank you, Mr. Pat. We've got time for one final question. I'm sorry. We got, it, the time got to wait for me tonight. It's almost 7 o'clock. So I've got to get to this last question and then have you all do some closing remarks. All right. How y'all doing? Uh, I actually have, uh, I live with my parents right now, uh, but we have some solar panels on our house. And it does like cut costs of electric bill and, you know. But uh, also, I've been kind of thinking that it doesn't really take away from the aspect of energy usage. You know, it doesn't really, you know, add or take away from it. It kind of like just evens it out. But what I have been seeing is that the city is surrounded by water. You know, and growing up, I, you know, studied the Hoover Dam and its effects on electricity, you know, output. So I've been kind of wondering, have the city, you know, the city government, city council, or uh, the, the governor, explored systems of hydraulic power, you know, to kind of, uh, kind of systematically deal with the pollution in the water, as well as deal with the energy uh, usage. Uh, the power of hydropower comes from gravity. Uh, in other words, the water falls from a high uh, place to a lower place, and gra gravity breaks the energy. So, like in the Appalachian Mountains or the mountains of the West Coast, uh, there are huge hydro plants that generate big amounts of energy. Uh, there's another use of hydro where you can pump it up with the energy that you have in the 
wind is blowing and the solar is, is uh, uh, sunlight is available, and then you use the gravity in the off peaks to even your peak out. But I, I get this question more than any other question. I think around New Orleans is, well, can't we get the Mississippi River or other places? And the answer is basically you don't have a, a gravity that creates enough uh, power to uh, generate a significant amount of energy. Plus, most water has other uses. Uh, it's either uh, out in the oyster beds or it's shipping down the river or something like that. So the, the most energy experts do not feel that there is a great uh, uh, delta of how much more hydropower we can get in this country. Uh, that's what we built in the 30s. The, the real change is going to come from wind and energy. Now, offshore Louisiana has a lot of people that are experts in building rigs, <laughs> and those rigs could go from being oil rigs to being wind power rigs. Right now, I think solar is probably more cost effective than offshore wind because those tend to be pretty high maintenance because of the wind and the salt uh, makes maintenance fairly high. But right now, I, I think the, the bird that's in the hand that we probably ought to run with is the solar, solar wind. That's, uh, for our climate and our uh, geology, that seems to work the best. I just have one extra point to put on that. So um, the the kinds of dams, the kinds of um, large hydropower Jay is referring to is the kind of, I actually grew up uh, just a few miles from one in Alabama. It's a part of the TVA system, the Tennessee Valley Authority. And it is a monstrosity. And this thing was built during the, um, or, uh, during the 30s. Uh, but my understanding is that in more recent years, uh, largely because those kinds of, that kind of hydroelectric um, also changed the, the run of some rivers and, and had some environmental impacts as well. There's been the development of something called run of river hydro uh, that is being used, my understanding is, um, in parts of Europe. It was, just, it was studied for a while, about seven or eight years ago here in New Orleans, there was a pilot program. And it was basically, they put turbines underneath, um, basically um, underneath the water and let you know, the water flow through it. And unfortunately, um, we, we are very fortunate, rather, to have a lot of sediment flowing down the Mississippi River, but the sediment was a problem for the run of river uh, turbines because it's just too much stuff running through there, and so that was abandoned. Uh, the thing that, that you started, though, uh, with, I think, is the one that I just want to always walk away with, which is um, having solar on your rooftop doesn't deal with how much energy you're using which means the first thing that we have to do is reduce our energy waste. It is always where the alliance will start. Um, I like to describe it as you've got to have your energy efficiency vegetables before you get your solar cookies. Um, you know, what's the point of generating extra electricity if you can reduce your waste first? And so I certainly agree with you, and, and every time I will suggest that we deal with our waste first, I don't know if everybody here has heard of or taken part in the Energy Smart program, which is a program here in New Orleans. Um, barring that, you can always call the Alliance. We're happy to point things out. Check out all the energy efficiency options you've got at your local hardware stores um, and, uh, and reduce your waste first. Very good. Can, uh, can we just take two minutes for each of you to give us some closing remarks, which you want to leave us with tonight? Can we start with Eliana? Two minutes or less, please. Yeah, I just wanted to first of all thank Renata for connecting me to Justice and Beyond. Thank you. And um, to Justice and Beyond as well for hosting me and, and all these panelists. And I really just want to encourage again, if you are interested in sharing any ideas and getting involved with the, what the local chapter is doing and your visions for how the Green New Deal could manifest in New Orleans, I really welcome that and hope that you'll come up to me after and give me your contact information. And I think just in general, as kind of has been echoed, there's a lot of really great ideas, but we need you know, as much public support as possible to be pressuring our public officials. So hopefully this will be the beginning of many more conversations around this really important issue. Thank you, Eliana. Mr. Pat. Thank you for Justice and Beyond to host this uh, discussion. And certainly to have uh, this 
very fine young woman here representing the youth of our, of our community. Uh, I encourage all of you who will spread the word about there being a march to Baton Rouge, April 3rd, Wednesday, April 3rd, through Sunday, April 7th. We will get to Baton Rouge a day before the legislature opens. We will generate enough concern that they will have significant questions to answer. So for those who want to join in that, get with me and I'll, I'll keep you cooked up. Thank you, Mr. Congress. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I heard a lot of good things about uh, Justice and Beyond, and this is my first chance to actually attend. And uh, thank you for all the good work you're doing. Uh, this is a, ba a battle that's fought in the personal decisions we make in our lives, in our local politics, where, as Logan says, our council actually regulates our utility at the state level and at the national level. Uh, maybe because I'm uh, 74 years old now, uh, I have a, a little different perspective. I've seen many cases in the past where we were about to do something good, and it was stopped because it wasn't perfect look back 10 years later and say, I wish we'd done that good thing. And we're in a case now where the US Congress has never passed a law to do something about climate change. Never. And they've had some opportunities. The House has passed them. It doesn't do any good for the House to pass something if it doesn't pass the Senate. So my, if you have a chance to do something better at home, even if it's not perfect, do it. If you have something to do better at the uh, local level, state level, grab it. And then we'll come back the next day and ask for the next step. Thank you, Ms. Uh, first, I want to thank not only Justice and Beyond, but what so many of the people in this room have done in moving New Orleans forward over the last couple of years uh, as in this energy fight. Um, the, the target or the focus uh, for a lot of us has been um, on, on a particular gas plant. Um, but I would argue that the momentum that all of you have been a part of uh, has gotten us to a place that we've got a council that is listening. Um, we, frankly, we have a utility that's been shamed, and we're in a position now to ask and to get what we deserve as a city, what we need, um, and, and I think we're in a really good place. And so I would just encourage everyone, while certainly we may, some of us may feel defeated, um, I do believe we're in, in a better position now than we were a year ago. And that's thanks to everybody here and everybody at home who's been um, calling and emailing and, and being a part of this. So keep that up. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you all. Thank you.